people who are logging on um, can all hear us. We're just going to give them a few more minutes to get set up, um, and then we will get going. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar, If You Care About Stopping School Pushout, You Should Care About Reproductive Justice. My name is Sarah Medeiros, and I'm the Communications and External Affairs Assistant here at the National Women's Law Center. Um, could everyone in the audience please type into the chat now that you can hear me if you can. Just want to make sure that um, the audio is being broadcast loud and clear. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a few technical notes before we begin. All attendee lines will be on mute during today's webinar. Uh, we'll be taking questions after our experts are finished with the main presentation, and we encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar. You can submit a question by using the GoToWebinar chat window visible in your dashboard, which can usually be found on the right side of your screen. A number of you just uh, found that now. Thank you to, to let me know that you're uh, able to hear me. So uh, that is exactly where you'll submit your questions. Um, this webinar will have live captioning throughout, which you should be able to see now at the bottom of your screen below the presentation slides. Um, and uh, lastly, the webinar will be recorded as a registrant and attendee. You'll receive links to the recordings of the presentation as well as the slides within the next few days. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Kelly Garcia, Director of Reproductive Justice Initiatives and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank all of you for joining us today for our webinar. If you care about stopping school pushout, you should care about reproductive justice. We are thrilled to have all of you join us. Um, for the second in of our webinar series for this year. We've been doing this webinar series for about 10 years in partnership with If, When, How. And um, so today I am going to, um, today we're going to be talking about school pushout. Um, I'm going to turn it over in a moment to Mariko Miki with If, When, Deputy Director at If, When, How to do a little, um, talk a little bit about this webinar series. 
Then I'm going to give a quick overview of the reproductive justice and the topics in terms of how it links with education and stopping school push out before I get to turn it over to our two main speakers, Nia Evans at the National Women's Law Center and Grace Dolan Sandrino, a student activist and co-author of Dress Coded, Black Girls' Bodies and Bias in DC Schools. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Mariko. Mariko. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Kelly. My name is Mariko Miki, and I'm the Deputy Director at the National Office of If, When, How, Lawyering for Reproductive Justice. We are so excited to have the opportunity to work with the National Women's Law Center again, and we're glad that you've joined us today and hopefully for the rest of the webinar series as well. Um, as Kelly said, when we started this series um, about 10 years ago, we wanted to highlight the many ways that RJ intersects with other important social justice issues. So today's topic, stopping school push out, is deeply intertwined with reproductive justice, racial justice, and gender justice. And we are very excited to hear from today's speakers and learn more about the work that they are doing. In case this is the first time that you are turning in, tuning into this webinar, or if you're not familiar with If, When, How, let me just tell you a little bit about us. We are a national nonprofit that trains, networks, and mobilizes law students and legal professionals to work within and beyond the legal system to champion reproductive justice. If, When, How believes that achieving reproductive justice will take thoughtful action and strategic activism, acknowledging the intersection of identities, collaborating across disciplines, and working toward a critical transformation of the current legal system. Because ensuring that all people have the power to decide if, when, and how to create and sustain families depends entirely on if, when, and how hard we fight. We work with chapters on law school campuses across the country, and we also work with a growing community of legal professionals, including our incredible Reproductive Justice Fellows. In fact, we are currently accepting applications for the 2019-20 fellowship, during which the Reproductive Justice Fellows will be placed at organizations in Atlanta, Nashville, Memphis, Oakland, and Washington, DC. If you're interested in applying, please visit our website, ifwhenhow.org. So on behalf of If When How, I just wanna give a big thanks to the National Women's Law Center particularly Kelly, Mikkel, and Sarah, as well as to our esteemed presenters for bringing their expertise to this webinar. Thank you for your interest in reproductive justice, and now I'll turn it back to Kelly. Thank you, Mariko, and thank you um, to Evelyn Howe for your great work on this webinar. Again, we are really excited to have this webinar today. Um, the goal of the series, as Mariko said is to really elucidate the link between reproductive justice and other progressive issues. And so we talked about sexual harassment in our last webinar and in um, this one we're talking about school push out and our upcoming webinar on Wednesday, November 14th will be on immigrant justice and reproductive justice. We are also starting to think about planning for next year, so please let us know if there are other webinar topics that you would like to see. So I'm going to take just a minute to talk quickly about reproductive justice. So the term reproductive justice was coined in 1994 by a group of revolutionary black women gathered for a meeting in Chicago. Reproductive justice combines reproductive rights and social justice. It's really rooted in the internationally accepted human rights framework created by the United Nations. Unlike traditional rights-based movements, it recognizes that multiple forms of social oppression and discrimination intersect to keep individuals from being able to live their lives with dignity and autonomy. So reproductive justice is broader than reproductive rights and recognizes that everyone should have the right to have the children they want, care for the children they have, and plan their families through safe legal access to abortion and contraception. So RJ requires that all people have the economic resources and political and social power to make decisions about their bodies, their lives, and their futures with dignity and self-determination. So as we're going to talk about today, rather than being places of, that address 
systems of inequality, our education systems can too often contribute to the systems of oppression that are antithetical to the reproductive justice movement. So today, you're going to hear about how a group of students in partnership with the National Women's Law Center took on the system of school dress codes in DC that can contribute to school push-up. These dress codes, which police girls' bodies, and particularly back girls' bodies, often violate Title IX. So when people hear about Title IX or hear me say the words Title IX, they often um, think about sports, and I think now um, we'll think about protections against sexual harassment and assault in schools. But Title IX is really broader than those issues. It prohibits any form of discrimination because of sex by schools. So Mia and Grace are going to talk more about dress codes and how they make it harder for girls to learn. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now. But I do want to note that dress codes that are based on sexist beliefs about girls and their bodies that are disproportionately enforced on girls or that in any way treat someone differently because of their sex violate Title IX. So I want to make sure that I leave time for me and Grace. So I'm going to turn it over now. Um, but at the end, we're going to have time for questions. And so if you do have questions about Title IX, that would be a great time um, to, to send them to us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mia Evans, Manager of Campaigns and Digital Strategies at the National Women's Law Center. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. This is Mia. As Kelly said, I am a Campaign Manager for Education at the National Women's Law Center. And I'm joined by my friend and collaborator, Grace Dillon Sandrino, and today we're going to talk about this issue of school push out and the campaigns that we've developed to combat it. Um, before we dive in, I think um, I want to do a quick kind of overview of the Law Center and, in particular, the education work that we do. So, I think most folks on the call know that the National Women's Law Center is a civil rights organization dedicated to protecting and promoting equality and opportunity for women and girls. Um, what that means specifically on the education team. It means a few things. We do three core things. The first is we really educate the public on the civil rights that protect girls in school, like Title IX, Kelly just referenced, um, and do our best to make sure that everyone at all levels of the school understands what those rights are and outside school also knows and respects those rights. The second thing we do is we do a lot of policy advocacy. So we work with school leaders, we work with elected officials to create policies that would expand opportunities for women and girls in school. And the third thing we do is we talk to women and girls about how they're experiencing school. Um, and in particular, we've been focused on girls of color and how they're experiencing school um, and what their needs are so that policymakers, advocates, school leaders um, can all take their needs into account when they're crafting policies on their behalf. So with that said, let's talk about this issue of school push out. We can go to the next slide. Oh, so first the plan. <laughs> So on this webinar, what Grace and I plan to do is to first talk to you about school push out, what the problem is. Um, we're going to walk through some of the data that we've collected on this issue that is startling and, um, and, is, and is indicative of why we should be having this conversation. Third, we're going to talk about the campaigns that we developed, two different campaigns that are connected to deal with this issue. I'm going to hand it over to Grace to talk about the student impact, but also the advocacy that she's done to combat this issue. And finally, we're going to talk about solutions, because this isn't an unsolvable problem. Girls don't have to be pushed out of school, so we're going to spend some time talking about um, the solutions and what we can do to keep them in school where they belong. Next slide. So what is school push out? Simply put, school push out refers to policies, practices, and actions that overwhelmingly target certain students, particularly black girls, and push them out of school through suspensions, expulsions, and school-based arrests. So this framework was similar to the reproductive justice framework developed by an incredible black woman named Monique Morris, who is a renowned scholar and researcher who was really has been doing this work for a long time and looked at our national dialogue around school discipline and just did not see girls. So I'm sure many folks on the line are familiar with the school to prison pipeline, which is referring to policies, again, kind of all of these different forces that um, contribute to black students, students with disabilities, um, going from classroom to the criminal justice system. And I think as a country, we've been having this conversation 
partly in thanks to President Obama, who started My Brother's Keeper, which, is, which was an initiative to look at school discipline and stereotypes in school. Um, but what we were missing was, was, was girls. We, they weren't a part of the conversation. Um, and it was particularly troubling because girls are the fastest growing population in the juvenile justice system. Girls of color, LGBTQ girls, and girls with disabilities are all overrepresented in the juvenile justice system compared to their national enrollment. And many of those students are there because of trauma, because they've dealt with sexual abuse, they've dealt with sexual violence, and they haven't had the support that they need to cope with such trauma and often respond in ways that are reasonable to escape that trauma and are punished for it. Um, so this framework of school pushout was really developed to dig into how racism and sexism shape school discipline policies and shape our understandings of black girls in the classroom. Um, and you know, this issue really does start as young as preschool. Black girls are 20% of girls enrolled in preschool, but they are 54% of girls suspended from preschool. So to say that again, this as young as preschool, black girls are 20% of girls enrolled in preschool and 54% of girls suspended from preschool. And a thing that I will hit home throughout this entire presentation is that it is not because black girls are misbehaving more than other students. There is no evidence, no research to suggest that being black means that you misbehave more. Instead, it is the way, it is bias, it is stereotypes, it's unclear and unnecessarily harsh discipline policies that all come together to push black girls in particular out of the classroom. So we can go to the next slide. So nationally, black girls are almost six times more likely to be suspended from school than white girls. Native American girls are three times more likely to be suspended. And this is data that's collected by the Department of Education Civil Rights Division. It comes out um, not annually, but I think it's once every three years. And this map that you're looking at shows suspension rates for black girls breaking, broken down by state in comparison to their enrollment. So the dark red shades that you're seeing in those states, black girls are more than 10 times more likely to be suspended than white girls. In some of the kind of orange ones there, black girls are more than six times more likely to be suspended. So this is a map that you can find on our website, letherlearn.org, and we have a state map and we also have a school district map. And what the state map shows is that in every single state, black girls are disproportionately suspended from school. Every single state, there's not one single state where black girls, where their suspension rates actually look reasonable in comparison to their enrollment. Um, and this map, um, if you look down towards the right, you can see um, kind of a drop down bar. We have, we have these numbers for different groups of girls. So we have our state and school district map. They both show suspension rates for black girls, for Latina girls, for native girls, for AAPI girls. And you can see what their suspension rates are in comparison to their enrollment. Um, for black girls, the numbers are particularly terrifying, but again, Native girls also face these rates at ridiculous rates. Um, and again, it is not, these uneven rates of dis discipline are not because of more frequent or more serious misbehavior. Um, it is because of the way that bias and stereotypes operate in the classroom. We can go to the next slide. So the second graph, um, which was also pulled together by our amazing team, shows um, the fact that law enforcement is more likely to be impressed to be in schools where there are students of color. So what you're looking at, the more, le the more students of color there are in a school, the more likely there is to be a police officer in that school. And that increases the vulnerability of black students writ large, but in particular black girls, because we see that police officers are often getting involved in matters of really, really minor discipline matters. Um, things like willful defiance, um, I, I'm sure many people saw in the past, I think it was two or three years ago, um, Spring Valley in South Carolina, there was a young student, a young black girl who had a cell phone in class and her teacher called in, the, called in a police officer and he attacked her and threw her out of her chair for her cell phone. Um, and I think a lot of people think those are isolated incidents, but they're not. Police officers are actually involved in um, really minor incidents all the time and um, it really, really particularly impacts black students and black girls in particular. And having these you know, additional factors that just increase the likelihood of students to be harshly disciplined just makes school push out all the more likely. So we can go to the next slide. 
So this is one of my favorite slides. There are a lot of myths about school discipline and a lot of um, assumptions that people have about why um, so-called zero tolerance policies, discipline policies are a good thing. And so I just want to quickly go through those and remember everyone should totally use your chat function because I'm happy to talk about these in a deeper way. But the first myth that we often hear is that students are excluded from the classroom for seriously disruptive behavior. And what the research shows is that that's just not true. Schools are using a growing number of out-of-school suspensions for day-to-day -day minor interruptions and often very unclear, very kind of subjective um, violations like defiance, non-compliance, lateness, truancy, and dress and hair code violations. The second myth we hear is that suspensions and expulsions are necessary because they bring order to schools. We also, also see that that is not the case, that schools that have moved away from um, zero tolerance policies, from suspension for minor issues, they actually experience higher ratings of safety. They have more student engagement, they have more attendance, they have more achievement. Um, the third myth that we often hear is that, which is the one that I probably hear the most, is that poverty and crime are the reasons why black and Latina students are suspended at such high rates. We also see that that is not the case. Um, research shows that race and not poverty is the driving predicting factor for school pushout. So that means that students of color who are in wealthy, well-resourced districts, they're also suspended at disproportionate rates compared to their peers. So these are just a few of the myths that we hear. And again, it all points to the idea that school pushout, that again, students are not, black students and black girls are not misbehaving more. Um, but in fact, that there are a whole lot of forces that are conspiring to push them out of school and keep them out. Next slide. So the roots of the problem. Um, in particular, when it comes to school push out, we see three main factors that are driving these things. The first, which I mentioned before, is stereotypes. Um, the hopeful, one of the hopeful things that I often share with people is that based on the research that we've done, black girls are more likely than any other group of students to see themselves as leaders. But they're also more likely to have their leadership qualities criminalized. So the smart girl becomes the know-it-all, and the outspoken girl becomes loud. The assertive girl becomes aggressive. So black girls in particular are dealing with a whole host of stereotypes ranging from the angry black woman stereotype to the Jezebel stereotype, the idea that black girls are just inherently more sexual than other students and aren't and as a result are in need of greater social correction. All of these things really shape the way that people see them and respond to them and contribute to school push out. The second thing that we see is um, vague and I would add unnecessarily harsh policies. So there are a lot of, we all know there are a lot of rules in school. There are also a lot of undefined rules in school. Um, black girls in particular are often punished for minor um, subjective offensive, things like defiance. Um, attitude violations, dress and hair code violations, all of these things that don't have an explicit race or gender, don't have explicit race or gender language, but all of which combined with stereotypes have a disproportionate impact on black girls in the classroom. So the final driver of this problem we see is the punishing of trauma. Um, and we know that students like everyone else are whole people and come to school with lives and experiences, many of which can be negative. And in too many cases, we've seen schools meet trauma with punishment, not support. So when a child is dealing with something in the home and might be acting out rather than asking questions or, or having support staff, mental health professionals on hand to help with that work, um, a lot of schools are relying on punishment, on removing kids from the classroom. The other form of punishing of trauma that I want to kind of shout is we've also seen a lot of girls, black girls in particular, reach out for help in the wake of some type of interaction with violence. And rather than receiving help, we've seen them punished. Um, and that can be sometimes punished for reporting violence. In some cases, we've seen a lot of survivors come to the law center um, who, who share stories of, you know, I was sexually assaulted in the gym, I went to the school, I told them that I was sexually assaulted, and they said, well, we don't know if that's true, but we do know that you're not allowed to have sex in the gym, and so you're suspended. So we've had a lot of survivors share with us that they've been punished in the wake of dealing with some kind of violence, either because of minor rule breaking that might have occurred at the time of the trauma, or just because schools are mistaking violence with a consensual um, activity. 
So again, writing rules in a way that disadvantage students who are seeking help is another way that, and, and you know, not having the support or competencies around trauma that we need to make sure that girls are safe and supported in school, all of these things contribute to this issue of school push out. Next slide. So as you can imagine, there are some very real and detrimental results and outcomes that come along with school push out. So we know that when girls are pushed out of school, they lose class time. And let me be clear, school push out can look like being suspended. It can also look like being sent to the principal's office for the rest of the day because you have on the wrong pair of shoes. Um, that's still class time loss. So anytime you are not in class, you are missing something, and that can increase your likelihood to get lower grades. Um, we've also seen school push out results in higher retention rates, so students are more likely to be held back because they are missing school. Um, we've seen lower graduation rates in high school and college. We know that when you are pushed out of school, when you are told that you don't belong in a school and you become disengaged, and you know that only increases your likelihood of coming into contact with the criminal justice system, especially if police are in your school. And ultimately, we know all these things affect students' job prospects. So if you do not graduate from high school, then you are less likely to be able to find a job with decent wages. Your health outcomes will be altered. So the school to poverty pathway um, becomes, I think, a very, very real danger for a lot of students who are pushed out of school. Next slide. So when we realized all of this, which is work that people have been doing for a very long time, and we you know, have been working to stop gender discrimination and sex discrimination in school for so long and collected a lot of information about this issue, we realized we got to get people around this issue. We need to create some kind of hub where people can learn about this issue and find the tools that they need to make some change. So for us, that's our Let Her Learn campaign, um, and we developed it in 2016, um, and the goals of the campaign are to educate the public on school push out, and in particular, how it impacts black girls, and to get black girls into the conversation about school discipline. Um, the second goal is to provide tools and resources for communities who are pushing for change, because there are many, many really inspiring examples of parents, students, educators who have come together, formed coalitions to change their policies for the better. And some of the ways that we do this work are through community education sessions. So we do Know Your Rights training, policy workshops, community forums with a variety of stakeholders. Um, we also engage in a lot of, or recently have engaged in a participatory action project where we are working with young people to better understand some of the issues that they're facing and generate solutions around them. And I'll talk a little bit about our dress code um, project in a second. And we also have a lot of advocacy tools that help people evaluate the policies at their school and create an action plan from there. Next slide. So one of those advocacy tools is our Let Her Learn toolkit, which again, plug, you can find all this information at letherlearn.org. But the toolkit is one of the first resources that we came up with. Um, and it helps really anyone identify bias um, in their school discipline policies. Um, so it has a checklist that helps you evaluate whether your school's discipline policies are fair. It has, it breaks down different categories where we know that girls of color are more likely to be punished things for things like dress code infractions, attitude violations, sex codes. Um, and it invites you to really get your discipline policy and that checklist together and go through and see whether or not you're, you're able to pull out those dog whistles, those things that might not on their face seem to be biased, but that we know have a disproportionate impact on girls of color. So that's one tool that we use to train folks and is very successful in starting to root out those biases. Next slide. So this, um, I'm so excited. This is one of my favorite projects. So Dress Code It, Black Girls, Bodies, and Bias in DC Schools is an example of a participatory research project um, that is under kind of the auspices of the Let Her Learn campaign. And this is a report that we released earlier in the year um, with 21 black girls who live and learn in DC to better understand the link between dress codes and school push out. Um, we took this project on um, in DC in particular because in DC black girls are more than 20 times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's the highest suspension rate in the country. 
And, you know, we've been doing this work for a while and through our conversations kept hearing dress codes come up as kind of that example of a set of policies that might not seem to be biased, but that overwhelming, overwhelmingly have a disproportionate impact on girls of color and that are really an unseen contri contributor to school push out. And so when we realized this, we said, you know, we want to work with the experts. We want to work we want to research this issue with the people who know it best, and to us, that is black girls. No one knows the issue of school push out better than black girls. Um, so we partnered with 21 students. This report exposes common problems with DC dress codes. It discusses their impact on students, and it, pro it, it proposes better policies. Um, and Grace, one of our amazing co-authors, is going to dig a little bit into this project and the experience of working on it and dress codes in DC. Um, but I want to quickly share a few findings if we go to the next slide. So what we found through this project is that black girls in D.C. are losing out on the chance to learn every single day simply because of what they wear and what they look like. Um, we found, unsurprisingly, that many of the dress codes in D.C. are rooted in stereotypes, um, that they police girls' bodies, that they are overly strict um, in D.C., Students should not be sent home for dress code violations. They should not be suspended for that. But we found ample evidence of girls regularly being sent home illegally against district rules for, dress, for violating very strict dress codes. And um, obviously, all of these things interrupt students' education. We found that many of these dress codes utilize subjective language, um, things, words like distracting, um, inappropriate, neat. Um, we also found that uniforms but also keeping up with certain dress codes can prevent can present a financial burden um, that many uniforms are expensive to keep up with and that we saw students who were being punished for coming in with a dirty uniform when they didn't have a washer dryer in their home um, we also found that dress codes were shaming bodies regularly that students were being told that they needed to change in order to avoid distracting their male classmates, or even to avoid being sexually harassed. Um, and all of these things, all these punishments and all of these messages really interrupt girls' education and send the message to the entire school community that how a girl looks is more important than what she thinks um, or what she learns, and that girls are ultimately responsible for the misbehavior, stopping the misbehavior of boys. And all of these things obviously fall under a bucket of discrimination. So this project, um, again, came out in April of this year. You can find it on lethearlearn.org. It's led to, I think, a real real policy kind of sea change in DC. Immediately after the report was released, um, we saw the District of Columbia Public Schools revise their teacher training to address this issue. We saw two different schools form task force to start to investigate their dress code policies and make some change. Um, and we're in continued conversation and continuing to advocate in the district to really see some long-term change so that we are seeing equitable dress codes as the norm and not the exception. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Grace, who is gonna talk a little bit about the student impact of school push out and this project, Dress Code It. Hello, um, I'm Grace Dolan Sandrino. Um, as it's been said, I'm a student activist and a co-author of Dress Coded. Um, thank you so much, Nia. Um, so the National Women's Law Center really did make um, an advocacy tool um, out of this report. Um, and in the end, there's even an, another checklist that you can go through um, and use to evaluate your school's dress code policies. But what they really did was come and talk to us, girls of color who are, are going to DC public schools, mm -hmm. and ask us what it was like um, to go to school and what the dress code enforcement looked like. Um, and I know, I know it might be easy for a lot of us to just think that dress codes are something that all students from possibly preschool all the way to high school deal with, um, and that's not a big deal. Um, and I partially shared um, that, that idea before getting involved with the report. And this, this report really actually educated me on a lot of my rights and how my rights have not been respected or have just been taken away from me 
um, period in school. Um, so what dress code enforcement really looks like in school was really different depending on the day, depending on who's standing at the security check-in, whose class you have, um, and what your relationship with a teacher that you might see in the hallway might be. Um, like it's been pointed out earlier, dress codes are extremely um, vague sometimes, yet they do you know, they do carry extremely strict consequences. And usually those consequences are vague as well, but, and they're left to the discretion of the, administ the administrator or um, teacher who, who would like to um, give you a demerit. Um, so when you're coming into school, you might be in front of a student who does not have on um, a, a clothing item that that abides by the dress code um, and they might not they might not get addressed for it um, but the student behind them might um, and that's something that seems to be an experience shared by a lot of the girls in this um, report that really depending on the day depending on who's seeing you um, how that person feels about you um, that you might get the dress code enforced you might get a disciplinary action or you might not um, and something that we were kind of talking about was shame-based um, shame based enforcement. And my school, I went to Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Washington, DC. My school did have um, a policy where if you did have a dress code um, issue, you did have to go to the Dean of Students to receive either an extra large t-shirt, um, if you were wearing a tank top or a crop top and you were dress coded or a uh, or you could go to the gym teacher to get um, a a piece of string to hold up your pants. Um, but in those two different options, there was also two different feelings. You know, when you went to the gym teacher, you didn't really feel um, embarrassed. The gym teacher provided strings to anybody who needed a belt that didn't have them. Um, and it was kind of something that students felt good going and asking for because they knew that um, our gym teacher just wanted to help them out and did not want them to get in trouble. Um, where when you're going to get an oversized shirt, um, that's not something that you would like to wear to school. It's going to be embarrassing walking through the halls because now other students know that, you're, that you've gotten in trouble and you've been dress coded. Um, and also it might not make you feel comfortable wearing something that does not belong to you. You don't know when it last was washed. Um, and at the end of the day, it wasn't your choice to put on. Um, so we really realized that dress codes were not used actually to change the climate of the uh, classroom so that more students could learn, but really they were just used to discipline students for whatever reason any teacher had, um, but cover it under something that that found its that found its place in the student handbook. Um, so there were a lot of issues that were that were echoed by a lot of students, um, and also this issue of like financial burden that many um, uniform policies had on students. Um, and there's just a, there's a long list that I'm I'm happy to go through actually right now um, of things that we found in a lot of our school experience. Um, so first off was that the that the codes were really, really vague, um, but the consequences were very severe. Um, and usually t students are getting pulled out of class or pulled to the side in the hallway. And when you're pulled out of class or pulled to the side, in hallway, you're not going to be spending time in class or even getting to class. And if you're pulled to the side of in the hallway and you're late to class, you're then going to be met with another disciplinary action of being late to class. Um, so this really poses the risk to a lot of students of losing class time and then look getting lower grades and then having lower grades, you're met with another consequence of of not possibly getting other academic opportunities and not getting those academic opportunities then influence the amount of social and economic opportunities that you can, that you will be put, that you will be able to receive after high school. Um, 
And this didn't make students feel any safer having a dress code. It actually made us feel really uncomfortable for our bodies to be subject to adults. Um, and it did really strengthen this idea of rape culture. Um, and actually not an idea, it's actually a very, it's a very real thing. Um, this really placed the responsibility of any anyone touching or commenting on your body on you. Um, and I remember one really, really unsettling incident that I had in my senior year where I was going to give a presentation um, and read a letter that I had written in a writing class. Um, and on my way to read, I was told by an administrator that there had been multiple complaints about me and whether or not I was wearing a bra to school. Um, and this was something that some other students that were asked um, to talk about their experiences with dress codes, they said that this has happened to them and that they've even been told that they had to wear bras to school. Um, this really puts us in an uncomfortable position um, and also shames us for our bodies. Um, and even though this wasn't in front of other students, it really did make me feel uncomfortable that somebody had, and multiple people had been looking at my body, then went as far to tell an administ another administrator um, about it. And now I'm being told before I'm supposed to go up and give a presentation. Um, so dress codes really ha do a great job of making students uncomfortable. Um, uncomfortable to show up to school the way that they want, uncomfortable to go into class, um, and uncomfortable to really settle down and learn. Um, and I don't think that there's any way that you can expect students to academically excel if they don't feel comfortable in school and if they don't feel safe. Um, this also poses a real risk to trans and gender nonconforming youth. Um, at schools that have gendered um, and binary dress codes, students who are trans or nonconforming can be given disciplinary, uh, if there can be disciplinary action taken against them for going against their um, prescribed dress code and really just expressing themselves. Um, and more than, it, this is not just dangerous on um, an academic level of getting an academic demerit, but it's dangerous on an emotional level. It's extremely traumatizing to force trans students to ignore their true identity and also to continue to present as, an, as the gender that they do not identify as. Um, this doesn't, but this is not just solely an issue that trans students are dealing with, but also gender nonconforming students. Some students, if you are, if you have identified with or you were assigned female at birth, you might be you might be required to wear uh, a skirt and you might not be given the option to wear pants or to wear shorts. This can make plenty of students feel very uncomfortable. And as a result, there's no way that they can be expected. Forms don't only pose a risk to trans and non-conforming students, but also to any student that cannot afford the uniform and the, and the amount of uniforms that someone might have to purchase. Um, at my school, we did not have a general uniform, but in our respective arts departments, we did. I was in the theater department um, and we had to have theater department sweatpants um, or black sweatpants. We also had to have a theater department t-shirt. Um, we have the option to get a theater department sweater. Um, and all of these things were between 15 to $25. And you couldn't wear the same thing every day. Um, you you definitely had to have multiple pairs of uniforms, you know, just to feel good and feel good approaching your work, not having to wear the same clothes every day. But not everybody um, can afford a $25 sweatshirt or, a fifth, or four $15 t-shirts. Um, but this isn't just an issue at Duke Ellington, it's an issue at so many schools that have uniforms and that and where schools have general uniforms, usually those prices are higher. Um, and I had an I had an incident uh, at my school where a girl was wearing leggings. Um, they were not black sweatpants, um, but black leggings are are a choice as well. But she was wearing gray leggings, and she got a detention. Um, so there's 
there's these very small details that can result in very large consequences. Um, and we know that this is that that there's also non equal enforcement for dress codes. Um, the same grace leggings that she was wearing, I actually lent to her and for most of my sophomore and junior year, I wore those leggings. I mean, I never received a, a demerit for them. So we came up with a few solutions, including this um, checklist in the back of the report, which I encourage everybody to go read and also to give to other girls in your community, other parents in your community, other teachers in your communities, so that they can all educate themselves and then take action to change these um, these policies. But you know, we want to see fair consequences. We want to see community engagement. Um, we want to see policy changes. Um, and I know that it's time to move on to the solution slide, um, but the solution slide is not the end of the solutions. We have solutions as students. We have solutions as girls. Um, and they're all here in this report. So I really encourage everybody to take a look at that um, and I'll pass it back to Nia now. Um, and I also welcome any questions later. Thanks, Grace. Amen to everything and well said. Just to echo a few of the things on the dress code side that Grace said, um, the main problems, the common problems that we found with dress codes in DC, but also beyond DC, is that many of them focus on appearance rather than learning that they often prioritize the education of boys over girls, they shame bodies, and that they often reinforce sex and race stereotypes. Good dress codes don't exclude students from school or from class. They celebrate body diversity and the expressions of diverse culture. They maintain gender neutrality. They are enforced equally regardless of race or gender. And they really invite the community to participate in policy reviews and evaluations. Um, and on the school push-out side, there are so many ways that we could stop school push-out. This is just a snapshot of a few of the policies that um, we are working on with different legislators and with different school leaders. The first is banning suspensions for willful defiance for students of all grades. Um, and again, willful defiance is a very, very subjective, undefined um, term that is often used to justify the removal of black kids, also students with disabilities from class all the time. Um, so stopping suspensions for something that is such a, that is so loaded, loaded with bias would make a huge difference. We want to see the end of exclusionary discipline and exclusionary discipline by that, anything that removes students from the classroom for dress code violations. And we want to, we want hair codes gone. We do not need them. Um, we'd also love to see school stock free uniforms for student use to get at that issue so that students are not punished for being unable to keep up with the financial pressures of a uniform or of a dress code, um, and also so that students are not having to wear clothing that makes them uncomfortable or 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 is purely intended to shame, which, again, you should read the report because we also found examples of that. We also believe that schools should be guaranteeing amnesty for students who have to potentially disclose rule-breaking behavior to report harassment or assault. We would like to see the elimination of arresting power for police in schools. I, I also think police shouldn't be in schools. Um, and that's the, the next point. We should be divesting in police and investing in counselors. And at the bare minimum, police should have training and they should not be involved in minor disciplinary matters. Finally, schools need anti-bias training at all levels, teachers, staff, students. We need to really start to grapple with the way bias plays out in our schools and in particular around school discipline. So those are just a few of the solutions. But again, um, many of the, all of these solutions really are informed by girls. Um, one of the principles that exists within the school pushout framework, which we also carried into our Just Code report, is truly an idea that black women have been reminding the world of forever, which is that the people who are closest to a problem have the answers to solve it. Black girls are disproportionately disciplined in every single state. They're more likely than almost any other group other than black boys to be removed from the classroom. They really have the answers that we need to stop school push out and to make it so that everyone can, parents, communities can raise their children in safety and with dignity. Um, so 
an unspoken part of, I think, this slide is that we really should be thinking about how we are bringing impacted folks, folks who um, are dealing with some of these problems that we're discussing to the table, not just to listen to them, but for them to be partners, for them to have um, control over what is happening, for them to be able to do more than inform, for them to be able to write, for them to be the researchers, for them to be compensated for their time and for their energies and for their labor. Um, so all of those things, I think, you can find in the dress code report, but I would also just issue a call to action for everyone to start to bring partners to the table who are the most impacted by the issues that we work on. And I'm wondering, is there one more slide? It might be the question slide. Oh, one more slide. So um, everyone should join the movement to stop school push out. This is something that has been happening for years um, and it really ramped up after the 90s and the whole tough on crime crap blew up and we used to be able to, we were totally fine for many years having schools where students were not removed from class for minor issues. And we really want to get to a place where we are able to support all different kinds of students and make sure that they are in class where they belong. Um, and one way to get started is to go to letherlearn.org, which is our campaign website where you can find research, you can look at different maps for a state, for your school district to figure out how your school systems are treating girls of color. You can use the Let Her Learn Toolkit to evaluate your school's practices and policies to see if you find any of those red flags. If you do find those, you can reach out to the Law Center for legal help, but also um, to start to see whether or not there are actions or collaborations that we can help you with in your community to start to make some change around this issue. Um, and that photo is a photo of a few of our amazing co-authors who are also featured in the report. Next slide. I think we're good for questions. Yes, that's all we got. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Nia, and thank you, Grace. That was really an amazing presentation. Um, I wanted to ask one of the questions that's come in that ties in really perfectly to what you were just talking about, which is a lot of the people on this webinar um, are don't or don't have someone in school aren't directly connected to um, K through 12 schools right now and so what are the things that they can do they can look at the checklist but if they're not in the schools like what are the things they can do to help support student activists or otherwise try to um, advocate on behalf of stopping and ending school push up yeah I think that's a really good question and one that we get all the time you definitely do not have to be directly connected to a school um, to make change in school systems. So I think I would encourage everyone, whether they are connected to a school or not, to look at that map and see how your state is treating girls of color. Um, all of us in our own ways are engaged with the states that we live in, with policymakers, um, and this issue of school push out, of school discipline, and sexual harassment really factors into it. I would challenge everyone to start to bring this to the attention of all of your networks. So when you're in, when you're having conversations with policymakers, all of these issues that we're discussing, they're playing out in a variety of spaces. They're playing out in schools, they're playing out in the workplace. Um, I would encourage you all to really kind of understand what's happening in your state and your community and start to reference these things when you're in positions of power or when you're in positions where you can really affect change with people. And there's also amazing organizations and amazing students who are every day organizing their communities to combat some of the things that we're seeing. Um, one of them is Girls for Gender Equity, which is based uh, organization based in New York that um, works with girls to address criminalization in all of its forms, supporting organizations like that. Monique Morris, who is again the author of the author and creator of the Push Out Framework, um, has an organization that is dedicated to um, expanding opportunities for black girls. I think that we have all seen in the past three plus years so many examples of black, black girls being brutalized in their schools. We shouldn't, but we have. And I think that there are there are many ways that all of you can use your platform to elevate this issue, to educate your networks on this issue, and to use the power, the positions, the spaces that you're in to really put this on people's radar as an issue that needs to be addressed. I'm gonna ask two kind of questions together. So we had one question um, about 
hair and hairstyles and um, if people, those were things that were, include, were included in, in school punishment, particularly around the DC report in dress coded. And then somewhat related in my mind is the second question, which is what, you know, is there any educational value to dress code? Two good questions. So I'll, I want Grace to take, have some space to answer the first one. I'll quickly jump in by saying that we've seen in DC specifically that a lot of the ways that the hair codes come into the picture are through the policing of like scarves or head wraps that students are allowed to have head coverings if they have a religious connection, but if there's a cultural connection, then they can be removed from school for it. And so a lot of the girls that we worked with were saying, well, I wrap my hair, um, I have a turban and I like to wear it and it's connected not to my religion, but to my community. And we saw a lot of students getting in trouble for it. But Grace, I don't know if you have thoughts on the hair question and then I can tackle the next one. Yeah, um, it's also very respective, like um, hair, it's very specific to the day um, and the person who who's the subject. But also I'm, I'm looking through the report right now and I can't find it, but there is a school in DCPS that um, in their dress code, um, they do say that if there is any distracting hairstyle or whether it's a style or whether it's a hair dyeing, um, that if it's deemed distract if it's being if it's deemed distractive, um, that uh, that that there that there can be a disciplinary consequence. And I'm just looking for it right now to see if I can find the school. Um, but there is a school that does that that did have that in their dress code and that it is in the report. And this is Nia, to the question about the educational value of a dress code, I think one of the things I often start with when I'm working with school leaders on dress codes is I ask them, what is the goal of your dress code? Because many schools have had them in place for so long that they no longer really have strategic specific goals for them. Sometimes they'll say, well, it's to teach students professionalism, it's to reduce distractions, it's to create an even playing field so that we don't see financial differences and certain students don't feel singled out. But when you talk to when you talk to students about whether those things are happening, I think what we found in the case of DC was that a lot of the policies that schools were relying on were were in direct contradiction to those goals. That by pulling students out of class, by shaming them in the hallways, they were distracting them. And that by asking them to purchase expensive uniforms or punishing them when they don't have a washer dryer in their home. They weren't leveling the playing field or hiding financial differences, um, that they were really punishing certain students and exposing them. That a lot of the schools that, were, that we work around in DC were actually doing the thing that they were trying to cut down on for their students. And so I believe that dress codes should advance equity, that they can be a vehicle to teach students how other students, how to respect, celebrate, and, um, and you know, I'm trying to think of the right word. I think that they can be a vehicle to teach students how to celebrate one another and respect each other. Um, I think to do that, you need to have policies that really reduce the focus on people's appearance. And you need to have, you need to lead with equity. One of the recommendations that students put forward was every dress code policy should have an equity statement. We should have, we should know that one of the goals of the dress code is to promote equity, is to promote equality, not by hiding differences between students, but by ensuring that students can come as they are, ensuring that students aren't going to be punished because of their culture or because of the way that their hair looks. Um, so I do think that asking the question, what is the goal of your dress code is important, and schools should be talking to students to see whether or not they are achieving those goals, because sometimes you can teach professionalism in a lot of different ways. Maybe dress codes are not the most, are not the most strategic way to teach students professionalism. One of our co-authors brilliantly mentioned, you know, my school says it's so that we learn how to dress for success, but I think it'd be better if we just had a week where we could learn how to dress professionally and they could provide resources and help us with that. You pulling me out of class because of because I'm wearing a tank top because it's hot outside and it's 80 degrees doesn't teach me professionalism. Um, so I do think that we should have goals around dress code and I think that they should be rooted in equity. 
Um, if there's one thing that I could just add, um, I think that it's really important, and I echo everything that was just said. Um, I think it's really important to evaluate whether there is an argued educational value. I think that there that that the educational value is really irrelevant until we see, recognize, and address the extremely adverse um, social, academic, um, and, and economic disadvantage that dress codes bring to school. Um, and that whether or not there's a goal that the school had um, putting these dress codes in place, they obviously have not upheld their purpose or they have, which is to discriminate against black girls, which is to discriminate against girls of color. Then they have done that. But but there's no there's there's really no way for us to um, argue for the, 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 there's no really argument that can really be held up right now about the educational value of dress codes because th we don't have a system that is in any way creating an educational dress code. Great, thank you both so much for presenting on this webinar. We have gotten some in the comments, some you know definite kudos and praise for the webinar. I think everyone found it really interesting and terrific. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And it's seven o'clock, so I think we're going to wrap up. I think. Thank you all so much. And um, for everyone who's still on the webinar, please keep an eye out. You should be getting an email with a um, link to additional resources as well as the slide deck for this webinar. Thank you everyone. Have a great evening.